Good afternoon, folks. So this is part six of Great Escape Week. Uh, and the final part later tonight is about the movie. So this, if you like, is the last of the serious studies. And I suppose it is the most serious because we are looking at the aftermath. And numerous books on Great Escape. We've had several authors on this week. Jonathan Vance talking about the preparation, the planning. Ted Barris about some of the Canadians involved. We looked at uh, Louise Williams talking about her uncle being murdered. Then we talked about um, Jens Muller, one of the men who made a home run, but this time we're going to go into depth and look at the German response and indeed the murders and then the re the, um, the investigation post-war. So to join me to talk about this, um, Guy Walters, who wrote The Real Great Escape. So good afternoon, Guy. Good afternoon, everybody, and good afternoon, Paul. Thanks for having me on. Um, and we're going to get launched straight in. I mean, the thing is that a lot of the conventional wisdom about this escape is that the murder of the 50 of the 76 who escaped was a complete surprise. There was no expectation of it. And it was, you know, a, a, on a, on an angry response by Adolf Hitler, but in your research, and you, you were heavily into the archives for this rather, rather than Jonathan Vance sort of speaking to veterans, you, it was all about the archives and documentation. You found uh, something that suggests that there, it was a little bit more um, planned than we had first perceived. So what when you went into your book, was your purpose to look more at the post-war investigation or tell the whole story? Where, how did you come about it? And I came about it because, I, <laughs> to be honest, I was looking for a topic uh, that I felt had been heavily mythologized. And um, I just sort of felt, well, there's you know, The Great Escape is one of those stories that everyone loves, everyone feels they know, and yet, you know, when you start you know, lifting up the rug and when you start looking underneath and going, well, where is the original story? You know, wh how does Paul Brickhill know all this stuff? Yeah, we know he was there, but, you know, is everything he writes reliable? You know, let's go back, and as you say, let's go back to the, the, the archives, let's look at the documents, and as any historian will tell you, the most reliable information, or probably the least unreliable information, <laughs> is the stuff that is generated nearer the time of the event. I mean, you know, a good copper will tell you that. You know, you're, gonna, you're not going to listen to the testimony of someone 10 years after the case if you've got an interview from the minute afterwards, if you like. So... I think that, you know, what I did was, right, well, let's just do, let's get forensic on this. Let's, let's, you know, let's look at every, all the documents, all the testimonies from nearer the time, and let's see what story we come up with then. Let's not read any other books. You know, that, obviously, that can be a framework. We can know which way the story's going, but let's look at the docs. And, you know, um, the picture that emerges is, as you know, you, you've read my book, you know my thesis in my book, um, and it, it, it's very different indeed. I mean, I, I slaughter all sorts of sacred cows. Um, you know, were the prisoners warned that they were going to be shot if they tried to escape and things are going to be very different? Yes, which is your question, clearly. Yeah. Um, you know, was it going to open up a, 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 a new front inside Germany and hamper the German war effort? No. Um, what was it going to um, help the Allies or help the Germans? Well, as I show, and I no doubt we'll talk about, there's massive blowback associated with the Great Escape. And in fact, it ends up helping the Germans. Um, was there a duty to escape? No. Did the majority of prisoners want to escape? No. You know, so, so what you're looking at in the movie, which I know you're going to talk about later, aren't you? But what yeah. you look at in the movie is a bunch of escape-hungry, handsome young men all wanting to run around and do heroic things. True picture is very different. And, you know, clearly, if you want to write a best-selling book like Paul Brickhill, you're going to tell the story of, the heroes, or you're going to put a big amount of topspin on the heroism. And, you know, my role in life was to write a more boring book. But I don't want to, don't want to let my publisher know things like that. But, you know, let, let's tell the story of those who wanted to stay behind a bit, who wanted to shirk, you know. So that's sort of where I was coming from. And, that, you know, when I met you at Chalk Valley two years ago, I mean, I, I asked you to sign the book for me, and you did. And you said something on the lines of, I hope it doesn't spoil it too much for you. Because, I, you know, I've been a great escape fan, if that isn't an yeah. odd word term for 40 plus years. And, you know, you threw some of my previous thinking on its head. And, and, and as I said to Jonathan Vance on the first show, he has been studying this for 40 years and he kind of, yeah. I got him to admit, you know, he, that he he's too close to it now in a sense. Yeah. He knew these people, he knew the survivors, yeah. he knew their families. And it's very hard 
to be objective once you've become part of the family you write about. That's happened with other vet, uh, historians I know who got very close to veterans associations. You know, you, you've you yeah. become brought in. You're part yeah. of the club now. So you can't now mess with the with the story. So yeah, um, I, think, I think it's just it, it is tricky. I think I think. You know, interviewing veterans is good. I I didn't. I only interviewed one or two for this. Well, well the, one of the simple reasons were they weren't that alive. A lot yeah. of them, and uh, and the other reason being that what is there to be gained by interviewing a, a old man? Obviously, in this instance, uh, elderly men, seventy, sixty years after an event. You know, m memory. You know, I, I don't know how old you are, Paul, but you know, I'm forty nine, and my memory's a bit older than you. Right, but yeah, but you know, we're the same age, and you know how terrible our memory is, and you know, blah blah blah. So I think that you know what you're what you're looking at is um, trying to interview people who sixty years after the event. What I found was is that when I did interview people, they were telling me stories that they didn't remember themselves, but stories they had read in other books. So in many ways, even you know, people in my shoes are tapping away. We can end up infecting and affecting the memories of the people we're writing about because they then pick up a book like mine or Paul Brickhill's and they'll go yes well the tunnel did fall short or this did happen and you go well you didn't know that you only knew that because you probably read it in the book and then you saw it in the film and then it became part of sort of popular culture so I think you're right I, I mean I think Jonathan you know I, I like to think that someone like Jonathan is would try to stay impartial but clearly if you end up being matey with veterans it becomes much harder to challenge their testimony and you know, it's it, it's nice hearing them. It's a privilege to meet them. You know, they're the ones who put their necks on the line. You know, I didn't. You know, our generation yeah. didn't. You know, the biggest thing we've had to suffer is being locked up a bit because of COVID. You know, so yeah. I mean, I you know, their sacrifices are real. Ours are you know, massively inconvenient. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, but it doesn't compare. But, but so, yeah, this, oh yeah, this is a great doc. Yeah, um, because this this is sort of moment because this this is the proof that there had been a warning about yeah you know, be careful lads so explain how you found it and what it what it actually represents and how much it sort of changes yeah, the, the, the I, I original people, narrative and I, I hope people can see this and i'm i'm just gonna maximize my screen a little bit so i can see it a bit more i'm still there am i good i'm yeah, pressing yeah. Button. and yeah and I, i'm just to talk it through this is a testimony by a um uh a so wing commander and wing commander williams um, given after the war. So, you know, this is something that I found, something I photographed in the National Archives here in the UK. And this obviously is, is a bit of testimony given almost immediately after the war, recalling how the Germans, and, and as I'm sure people can read at the moment, recalling how the Germans were going around the different compounds, quick parenthesis, remember that you know, the Great Escape took place from the North compound and there were yeah. lots of other compounds as the war went on because more and more people were being shot down. And the um, and, and you can see here that um, there is this uh, communication to senior officers regarding future escapes. I'm in the sort of second paragraph there, particularly those carried out when an invasion had taken place. Look, everybody knew there was going to be something like D-Day around the corner. And it said that if one or two people escaped, the matter would be reported to the very highest authorities. And the consequences would be very serious. If a mass escape occurred, those left inside, as well as those who escaped, would be caught would suffer unusual consequences. Now, as we know that those left inside after the Great Escape didn't suffer unusual consequences, but it's absolutely clear that the senior Allied officers in these compounds were being warned that, listen, things have changed in Germany. You know, there was a leaflet that went around all the camps saying escaping has ceased to be a sport. Mm. Um, and now, of course, you don't want to do what your enemy tells you what to do. You're, you're in a bloody fight with him. You're in a war with him. You know, I'm not going to obey, you know, but but actually they were the relationship between the camp guards and the camp officers and the actual POW officers and imprisoned was not the kind of goodies and baddies relationship. It was a much more sophisticated relationship than that. You had British German officers, our age, old men, Paul, <laughs> guarding men who are young enough to be our sons, you know, in their early 20s. And you, they had a very kind of paternal, avuncular, schoolmasterly relationship between towards these young lads, and they and they they cared for them. They looked after them. They translated their letters. They made sure food got through. They made sure that they were psychologically okay. So there was a much more of a duty of care in the camps than you might think. Yeah. And so the idea that this is just some 
nasty German baddie telling good Brits to behave. It's not that simple. This is kind of man to man, father to son. Listen, chum, you know, you, 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 you can muck around up to a point. But listen, if you the subtext of that document is if this is it, it's final warning. Other people are going to take over. And those other people are going to be wearing SS uniforms or they're going to be wearing the plain clothes of the Gestapo. And you don't want to mess with them. Mm. And everyone knew in 1944 what the Gestapo meant. Everyone knew what the SS meant. And, and that is the key to that document. And so the idea that someone like Roger Bushell, who wasn't the senior British officer, but he was in charge of all escape activity and he reported to the senior British officer, the idea that he didn't know about that warning cannot hold water in any way. And yet still the escape goes ahead. You know, that's, that is a potential black mark against Roger Bushell, risking young lives in order to achieve what he thinks is a grand scheme. And a grand scheme that I'd argue isn't doesn't even have any military validity at all. You know, it's a total waste mm. of time. And David O'Keefe, historian, says, so why was the change? I mean, I can understand the escape provoking this, but why before? What was in the air? I mean, it is... It, it's, it's a good question. There's a lot of things come. There's the terror flyers. There's the commando. Well, this is this has been building up yeah. for some time. Two years of just gradual ratcheting up the stress the Germans are about allied personnel found behind the lines. I'm using it a loose a loose term that because you're talking yeah. about commandos, pilots, the whole lot there. But what was in the air in the spring of '44 that really kind of sets this into motion? Do you think? Well, I think I think you nailed it there, Paul. In many ways, I think that what you're you're looking at is is a is terror flyers uh, absolutely nails it i think that this idea um that after years of saturation bombing day and night of german cities um and heavily inaccurate bombing um you know allied downed allied airmen weren't the most popular people in germany um mm. and and so the idea that they would just you know bomb your town your village or whatever and they would just sort of you know if they'd been shot down that they would then just have a cushy life at the German taxpayers' expense, if you like, <laughs> you know, caused an enormous amount of resentment. Now, of course, the Blitz in the UK was 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 a terrible thing, um, but it was relatively insignificant, relatively compared to what uh, the, the the British and the Americans uh, and and the Russians, but especially the British and Americans, meted out to German civilians uh, during the war. So, you know, this idea of terror flowers, if it's not an expression that people know. You know, really took hold. And if you were shot down, you bailed out your Lancaster and you fell, you know, in the suburbs of a you know, a town, um, you know, the locals would rush out. You know, I like to say with their pitchforks, but sometimes the Burgermeister Burger would, would run out and, and 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 there would be a lynch mob. And a lot of the war crimes, which I have in the CROCAS uh, Central Registry of War Crimes and Security Suspects directory here somewhere in my office um is it's about that thick and a lot of those war crimes that the allied war crimes units are investigating as you know i wrote a book about this yeah those those were you know auschwitz -y things those were wanted for the murder of two downed allied airmen you know that's one of the most common entries and you've got to ask yourself if, if someone's just bombed my village to smithereens and killed my kids and then he floats down to earth on a parachute you know <laughs> i might open up the shotgun cabinet yeah, so well, this very thing came up when I had Sean Feast on earlier this year talking about yeah. the lost graves of Penamunda, that very thing. Yeah, and it was the murderers were very low level. That you know, they weren't the goose stepping, leather coated yeah. Gestapo guys. It was people in a town who were under the influence of other people in a town who had been bombed, as you said. The town is in ruins, and there's yeah. two people who represent the uh the 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 ruination of your village there, and and yeah, they they were they were murdered. So the, the writing get, had you, on the you, wall. You, 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 you can see how you would might get. I mean, I'm not, I'm not excusing, I'm not forgiving it, but it is understandable. And after being radicalized since 1933, perhaps, you know, it's 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 a horrible cocktail. So yeah, and I, and I think that so that was one of the reasons why to answer David's question was 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 definitely why it came in. And I felt that there was just suddenly became this sort of, you know, sort of saturation of being really really quite angry now with the Allied flyers. I think also Hitler becomes in a more and more kind of vengeful and bitter insecure mood um and i think that when we spool forward to the the zargon order the order that specifically is going to kill 50 of our men um it, it, you know he he's fed up i mean you have the argentine caves massacre as a result of a italian partisan uh, massacre of 30 30 or so members of an ss police battalion in the via Rosella in rome 
I mean, that's obviously after what David's talking about. I, I think that also they were aware of the fact that kind of escaping was getting a little bit endemic. Um, it wasn't tying up German troops, but what it was doing was, was you know, it was men in uniform. I mean, we, we can talk about how the Germans react to a mass escape if you want, because I think that's interesting in terms of blowback. But yeah, yeah I, mean, I, think it's question. I think it's yeah. a basically a build-up of anger and annoyance. Well, that's one of the things. One of my best mates here, normally Colin Taylor, who's a tour guide as well, who always yeah. refers to escaping as that upper class getting one over matron element. The, the coldest kind of comes <laughs> in that, and it, there's an element of that. And if you know, as you said, you established her, these are more senior Germans in the Luftwaffe. Everybody's a long way from home. The German guards included, because Zagan is in the middle of nowhere. There's no big, lovely cities you can go to. They're in the middle of a forest, so everyone's feeling that sense of isolation. And you've got some sort of rapport between the prisoners and the staff because that's just how it is in any kind of prison yeah. environment on a day-to-day -day basis. You have to live in the same world. So it's good morning. Hello. How are you? And there, and yet there's these persistent attempts across Germany to try and escape with the, this, this idea, the British Airmen and Commonwealth Airmen, that you're just going to get put into the cooler for a couple of weeks. And, yeah. it's, and yeah. you can see that after a while, that's just going to stop pissing people off yeah, you know you're absolutely right and it's and i think i think you touched upon there but there's also this idea that i mean one of the other myths in the book and i think that this also it does feed into this it's this, this idea that everyone in the camps wanted to escape i mean it's just yeah. not true um and, and i you know you only have to read the book or the testimony of someone like jimmy james who was a legendary escaper um and and he says in in his you know, there's an interview in the Imperial War Museum, which you can go and listen to if, if you can get access to it. But I did. And and he said about, you know, a third of POWs wanted to escape you know, or get involved in escape activities is how he put it. Um, and so the, so and the other two thirds are very happy to sit it out. I mean, that barbed wire represents security as much as captivity. Um, mm. And, you know, and it was regarded you know, escaping as being a member of the kind of, you know, what was called the sort of tally-ho set, you know, we'd guard them as, you know, the sort of slony poshos, um, you know, dare I say it, probably people who speak a bit like me. And I, and, and I, and, and just this, and it's just a kind of bit of them and us there. And also those who were professional flyers or those who were, you know, professional RAF officers who were shot down quite early in the war had an understandable chip on their shoulder that they felt, well, well all their friends who haven't been captured you know, again, at home for tea and medals and promotion. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you stay the rank you're shot down at until the day you walk out that camp. So, yeah, you know, you're shot down as a whatever it is, a flight lieutenant. You know, your mate is a squadron leader a couple of years later, and he's got you know, whatever DSOs coming out of him, and you're just still there as a flight lieutenant. So, if you say to yourself, "Well, at least I tried to escape. I tried to do something." Now, I'm sympathetic to that. You know, yeah. well, at least you're doing something. But don't don't kid me. That that's actually going to make a difference to the German war effort. What it's going to do is make a big difference to you psychologically, and and that is understandable and that is reasonable. But there is no duty to escape. Just to while well, I remember that, there was a duty to evade capture after you had been say shot down or you you know blah 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 to get back to your lines. That that's in the book. You know you got to get home. Once you've been captured, there was no formal duty to escape. There was a kind of corporate duty to escape in the sense that you had a duty to be brave. You know, you have a duty not to be a coward, but it's not written down. And this is why two thirds of people don't do any escaping, don't even you know lift their fingers to help forge a pass or do things. And, and in one camp, there was a story about how one of the prisoners put all the kind of uh, into a tin. Sorry about this is very sort of floral mug, but he, he put into a put into a tin all the uh, escape plans. He scribbled all down a piece of paper, put them in a tin. And then he sealed up the tin and threw it over the barbed wire into the German side of the camp to give away all the escape plans that were going on in his camp. Why? Not because he was a traitor, because he felt that actually these escape plans were and, and all these escapes going on were just kind of making life boring and difficult for the prison population, the POW population, because the, the Germans would keep, keep carrying out searches and would get angry and so on and so forth. So you've got this them and us feeling. And people would have regarded Bushel, who was you know, came from a very wealthy, moneyed South African family, uh, and, um, you know, a lot of money, had a very sort of laconic air to him. He's quite a sort of the sort of the worst sort of arrogance of the lawyer. Sorry, any lawyers listening, but again, a very sort of lawyerly figure. He was described as, uh, and and um, 
and and so he did rub people up the wrong way and and i feel that a lot of the great escape was due to the fact that bushel had this mission having been shot down on his first day of operations you know to sort of prove a point to himself um now i'm not saying he led them to their deaths but i think that actually i think by march 44 february 44 he could have gone you know what you know there's no point and when the great escape did happen when the people were murdered mi9 in london the uh, intelligence organization that liaised with prisoners said and, and via the red cross don't try any more escapes your duty such as it is now is not to escape because it's just too bloody dangerous and too pointless you know what's yeah. the difference you know if it was if it's pointless on march the 25th 44 you know after the escape why is it not pointless on march the 23rd before you know it's achieving nothing and that that i'm glad you reinforced that idea about it it not being a duty to escape because that just it keeps repeated all the time and you see it, you know, everywhere. Um, and Roger Bushnell, I mean, clearly he's an interesting character and that's, I'm using that word carefully, yeah. you know, and probably a lot of those escape people, the ex organization, they're very forceful pers personality types. They're, yeah. they're quite demanding. And, you know, we, I had the, the show earlier this year about Massey, because there's the nice new biography about Massey and he's balancing all sorts of things as senior British, including really bad health for a start as well. Just the fact he's yes, that's right, yeah. falling off and he's dealing with the people who don't want to escape, the people who do want to escape. And I can imagine the people outside his door every day are the escape people, not the kind of the quiet ones. So it's, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing he's getting a lot of pressure to do that. And, when I did the interview, uh, the program with the family members, one American lady, Cindy Avery, her dad only joined Stag of Three, and okay, a different compound, but it was May. And you sense that it was that sort of, so why are all the boards missing off the walls? Why, why, why are rations on half? And it's because some people who you didn't even meet try to escape two months ago and then they're but they're the ones who've got to endure the winter with that with 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 less heat in the heart. They're the ones that have to endure the March yeah. in January, and you can understand there's a sort of a bitterness from these other ones about how their yeah. lives were made worse. Um, Absolutely. And I, and I think that as, as the war drew on, I think that, you know, as Red Cross parcels stopped getting through, I think that, I mean, Stalagler 3 didn't have it that bad, but some of the camps, and there's a very good book that I recommend people should buy by SP McKenzie called the cold. It's myth. It's not saying that cold. It's was a myth, but it was saying that how this boy's own uh, commando comic version of the war of POW camps throughout the war is kind of, these kind of minor public schools in the Silesian woods, you know, actually wears a bit thin because actually some of the prisoners were malnourished by the end of the war. I mean, nothing like those in Japanese hands, of course. And yeah. that's a, that's a different, and, and of course, nothing like those, you know, in, in, in places like Auschwitz, of course, you know, it's, it's not the same. There are no sort of death marches or massacres, but you know, uh, there were people in a pretty parlous state. Um, but actually in style of three, you know, they, they had it. Okay. Um, but you know, and I, and I, but there were, there was an awareness even in the forties when clearly there was less emphasis on, you know, psychological damage, but there was a very strong understanding even then that this captivity was sending some of these guys a bit stir crazy. They would make them move huts to see, you know, to hang out with different people just for a bit of variety. So there, there was a sort of an understanding of the fact that, you know, it, it was tough um you know psychologically so actually escaping as a way of alleviating boredom of a way of just doing something actually had a psychological benefit to it even if it didn't have the strategic or military or, or any other form of benefit at all but that's not the argument the, the, the people put forward they put forward the argument of it snarling up the german war machine if they would if people would just say and I, i'm i'm playing devil's advocate today because yeah. i was a different kind of personality in the previous shows it's the point of each each show being slightly different but the argument is always made about it snarling up the German war machine, it causing all this chaos, it's a second front, however you want to describe it there. If people just say it was a way of keeping people healthy, it was a people keeping them focused, it was a way of encouraging mm -hmm. teamwork, that's 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 a different argument. And I would I would agree with all those things. Keeping people motivated is very important. But I I, I feel we we will get back on point. So 77 years ago, right now, <laughs> two days after escape. <laughs>
everything is now kicked off. The the, the you know the, the the campers alerted everybody, the police, everybody's in it. So what what happened at the various levels with the German response? Did it a local response going up to a higher yeah. response? Kind of take us through those stages. Yeah, yeah, you got it, you got it. Uh, um, you're right. Sorry, I, I my fault. No, it's, it's my fault. Not on on the legacy, but no, it's good. Hopefully, people are interested. I mean, they're, they're still watching. They're so still watching. Good. The viewing oh, numbers are going up. I haven't so got YouTube good. on at the same time, so I was worried I'd then get a kind of horrible loop. Um, I. What happens is, right, so suddenly, you know, whatever time it is, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, something hits the fan. And uh, and 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 so, you know, from, from the moment the guard shouting, you know, you know, at, 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 at Reval Carter and, and, and the four guys around the empty tunnel, what happens there is an escalation of reporting to all the different agencies um, throughout the Third Reich. So obviously the guard reports to his superior, um, uh, then, then it goes to the camp officer staff, that's then reported to von Lindiner, the commandant, who is uh, probably at his home at Jeschendorf Manor overnight, um, which is quite nearby. Uh, obviously, then uh, part of the camp administration will then have to report to the local Kripo, the criminal police. Um, so those are just regular police, but they also are somewhat you know, inter intermixed, you know, and there are people who will know the kind of minutiae of how all the various uh, police forces in Germany meld together. It's very complicated, but of course it ends up to the attention of the Gestapo, the Geheimstaatspolizei, or the you know the secret state police. So you have got those agencies all running around um, on a local level. The local kind of main headquarters for the Kripo and the Gestapo is in Breslau, Rotslav today. I hope I pronounce. I never know how to pronounce Rotslav properly, but you know, hopefully, um, someone uh, will. Um, thank you, Colin. Uh, will will correct me on that. And and then of course that gets wired to Berlin, where it comes across the desk of the head of the Kripo. Um, uh, thank you, David. That's great. Actually, I go now. He's bought the book, and that that ends up uh, ends up uh, uh, ends up. Uh, uh, it'll get me about a pint, so yeah, half a pint, and that ends up on the desk of a man called Arthur Neighbor, who is head of the Creepo. Um, you know, one of the war's biggest chances, frankly, uh, and also been involved in Einsatzgruppen. Um, and what what happens then is it goes that when you're taken prisoner, your photograph is taken. So a perfectly sensible administration uh, uh, in case that you are on the run. You know, what they you know what you look like. And and so that the, you know, the photos of the escapers then get put in a kind of uh, a, a kind of uh, the daily police sort of sheet that gets wired out all over the third. Right. Look out for, you know, Woodage Paul, Walter's guy, you know, yeah. zero up X, X, Y. Um, and um, thank you, Stick. Uh, Ballard. Yeah, abs absolutely. Well, there's a lot about Bushel's motivation um, I I in my book. Again, another sale will be lovely and I'll get too yeah. quick. Yeah, and, um, and so so what happens is because it's a mass escape, there are ver various levels of alarm called fandom. And when there's a mass escape, as the prisoners are warned, there would be something called a gross fandom, a very, very big alarm indeed. Now, what happens with the gross fandung, and this is a really important myth-busting point, which I really want to get across. With the gross fandung, every man in uniform who's not fighting or doing anything, anything better, so a member, a, a, a troop sitting in a barrack doing nothing, uh, Hitler Youth, German Forestry Service, you know, Grenz Polizei, Frontier Police, um, cre member, members of the Kripo, anybody who's in a uniform who's not doing anything else is sold to go and you know, look out for any escaped prisoners in your area, obviously with the focus being around uh, uh, Zagen, as it was then called, uh, you know, in Silesia, it's now in Germany. And what happens with, under a gross van doing is that you have enhanced security at railway stations, you have enhanced security at level crossings, at bridges, any places where people are likely to walk or travel through extra checks on trains and so on and so forth. Right, okay, it's a hassle for the Germans, but it's not affecting the war effort. I mean, this is a largely a civilian police matter um and and what happens is because of this enhanced security situation you start rounding up lots of other people you're looking for anyway so when there was another mass breakout of allied pow's in 1943 led by wings day who some of viewers will know i think it was 43 got out in 1943 all those guys were recaptured right one of them committed suicide i think or one of them died but as well as all 43 being captured in the Gross Van Dung, an extra 14,000 got rounded up all throughout the Third Reich. Escaped slave labourers, escaped people from concentration camps, escaped criminals, escaped Russian labourers and prisoners. You name it, anybody who was the enemy of the Third Reich and wasn't where he should have been 
you know, in 1943, around the time of that escape, 14,000 of them were arrested and rounded up by the Germans under the Grossfandung caused by Wings Day and his pals. So it doesn't take much to realise you've got massive blowback, right? So what you're doing is you, you're ruining it for all your fellow allied naughty boys and girls, perhaps, running around the Third Reich. OK, you might be, you know, also the Germans might be arresting the odd rapist. That's all right. But but the point about it is, is that you've got massive amounts of blowback. Did the POWs know about the blowback? You bet. Because Pieper, one of the German camp guards, says to them, it's a stupid idea. You know what? We won't do anything if you escape, probably, in, in ones and twos. If you have a mass breakout, you're going to get a, a, an SH-1T storm hitting you. And 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 they knew that was going to happen. Bush knew it was going to happen. So the blowback thing, ruining it for everybody else, I think is a really damning part of, of assessing the great escape. Because as a result of the Gross Van Dung, uh, you can bet your bottom dollar that thousands of other people would have got rounded up as a result. And did the POWs know that? Yeah. And I think that's a real problem, a real problem. Mm. And, and, and you've got, you know, people with very amateur false passes, you know, with Leipzig spelt wrong, for example, on one pass. You know, that's why one of the great escapers was picked up. You know, um, you know, the, the, some of them were wearing coats with British tailors names in them, you know, Geeves and Hawks. You know, it, it, it's not like, you know, it's not like these guys were blending seamlessly into the bloody background. Um, you know, and, and and you've got some of them are just looking, frankly, very British. Um, yeah. You've got a man like well, that's, Des the, that's the movie, isn't it? Where James Garner yeah. somehow manages to get a kind of off the peg, light grey lounge suit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Goes, What the <laughs> hell is that? And the lovely hat David McCallum wears. You know, you look at some of the photos of the recaptured people, not just from The Great Escape. It's almost like the Germans took their photos because they're so bad. Look, they're, look he was going out with, you know, he just sort of, yeah. you know, Took I think a, we've took got some of those. We've got some of those. I think I Sorry. sent you a picture of of. There's a guy. I sent you a picture of one of them with a little briefcase um, carried there, and it looks like wearing a pair of knickerbockers. And I've also, yeah, there we go. And 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 you can just see that that is a sort of uh, a, a very un-German great coat. I mean, that is a military great coat. Yeah. Um, and in, there he is. Um, you know, captured. And and then I think also I've got some pictures. I think taken at Reichenberg. Um, of of the creepo ones, uh, I think the, the mug shots. Uh, the, 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 there we go. That, yeah. yeah. So this gives you some ideas of of what they are wearing, and you know, and and there you can see Reichenberg. That is the name of the creepo Steller on, on the left, bottom left there. That is Johnny Bull, Leslie Bull. Uh, yeah, but who's who's? I mean, really sad story about him. Just in parenthesis, that he he his his girlfriend or wife was pre his wife was pregnant when he was shot down. And and he never he never met his unborn child because of course he was murdered. But he was the first man out, and I have to say he, there's a touch of the Brad Pitts to him, isn't there? Mm. Um, especially in the, in the in the profile shot on the left, and he's like, what a handsome chap. And uh, and you know and and these pictures and and their pictures when they're taken prisoner would have been looked at by Art and Neighbor um, when he was deciding who who had to who had to live and who had to die. But again, you you get the ideas of what they're wearing. Sometimes they're these pictures of the great coats. You can notice in some of the pictures the same great coat because I think the Germans are trying to take pictures to show what they're wearing. I mean, Jimmy James recounts how he was just wearing, you know, very, very uh, um, simple um, chinos, effectively, what we're today called chinos. Um, you know, and the temperature, I don't know whether this has come up in the week you know, previously, but, you know, March, you know, I don't know what it's like in France at the moment, Paul, but here it's quite a nice day. It's about eight or nine degrees. It's late March. It's 77 years later. 77 years ago in Silesia, it was bloody cold. It was about naught degrees, minus one, minus two. And it, it was not a uh, it, it was cold. And if you were wearing just a pair of basic you know, boots or shoes, chinos and a little you know, tunic, you know, probably a bit like this. Yeah, it's not great. You, 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 you're going to be it, it's going to be, you know. It's going to be parky. And, and you're not going to spend many nights out on the run without looking terrible. And that's the reason why a lot of them got rounded up, Paul, is that they, they just look terrible. Yeah. And some yeah. of them just have and, and, and drawn and cold and hungry and, and, and looking out of place, just looking out of place in environment. You know, even with the people who moved around. I mean, when we had Asgir on yesterday talking about Jens Muller, I mean, two Norwegians and a Dutchman. Of course, they blend in a bit easier because yeah. they're foreigners who are, you know, and they just, 
It was easy. They're allowed to be there. They're allowed to. Norwegians are part of the Third Reich, not that they want to yep. be. And 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 they and they are they they are they composers forced laborers. But you've got a man yep. like Desmond Plunkett, who I'm sorry, I should have sent you a picture. But if people Google Desmond Plunkett Stalag Luf three, you will see a magnificent. <laughs> he's got a massive moustache, and he looks like a man called Desmond Plunkett. He sounds like a man called Desmond Plunkett. He poses as a Bulgarian called Sergei Belanov, hoping that no one who talks to him will know any Bulgarian. But there's a great, I mean, you know, it, 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 in my book, I recount some of the moments in which, you know, he's he's out of Gents Your Idol with his escape partner, Bedrick Dvorak, who's a Czech. And 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 they and he's standing at your idol because he's desperate for a pee. And then when he's finished, he goes, oh, that's better. You know, as we all do, uh, <laughs> us chaps, you know, we all say, well, that's, that's better. And and of course, the German next to him goes, "What? <laughs> Who's this bloke going? That's better." He has to scarper it out the loo, and you know, and he's always accidentally speaking in English, and he just looks like a Brit. You know, I remember once going to Colditz and talking to. If anyone's been to Colditz, there's a little sort of a guest house in town run by uh, a British bloke called John Smith with his sort of um, German partner, and, and 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 John Smith just said to me. I could just tell you're a Brit the minute you walked into town. You know, it's just so obvious. You know, you Brits just stick out. You know, we Brits just stick out so much. Yeah. And and we just do, you know, and you know, in the same way as I could, you know, you, know, you just see someone walking around. No, I, mean, I, mean, you know. I mean, normally, norm, a normal year, I can spot the Americans, I can spot the Canadians, I can spot the British completely. You just, it's just the, the hair, the clothes, the way they walk, the way they look, easy. You, you, you're you never wrong. You're never, it's yeah, the yeah, yeah. from the Belgians get very much because it's they, they kind of blend in with the French. But the, the, the English speaking people here, I can spot them a mile off and they spot me a mile off, you know, it's yeah, so it's, it's, oh, it's obvious. So, but, so, Good the luck trying is, to hide. And if you're trying to walk through, and the other problem is if you're trying to walk through rural communities, so where I live in the middle of Wiltshire, you know, we've got two villages, we've got 600 people in each village. Ooh, yeah, if I see someone go driving past who I don't recognise, who's that? Who's, who's that? that? And this is peacetime. But if I know that the local POW camp's in a mass breakout, yeah, I'm I'm going to be on extra special, you know, you know, detail looking for these people. So yeah, but, then, but now we're bringing up this idea that Bushel's idea was not necessary to do the to, to get the home runs. It was to just get the men out of the camp. That in itself, from his point of view, is the victory. You've now snarled up the German machine. The fact that some men did consider or or, or or hope they would actually make a home run back home is sort of secondary to what Bushel's actual aims were. And we can judge his plan if we want to later on in the show. But from his point of view, getting men out of the camp, even if they're rounded up quickly, was already a victory. Of course, what we're leading yeah. into is the fact that the Germans go, you know, and hey, yeah. and that that he couldn't have known. Well, he, we said he could have known, but that, that the, the, the complete reaction was maybe a bit... I... I think to be fair to Bushel, it would have been reasonable for him. And had he lived, I suspect that his response would have been, I mean, there's never, ever been a kind of reckoning. There was never a reckoning after the escape in the aftermath, after 50 people um, had been murdered. And we can talk about the murders, I'm sure, in, 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 in quite soon. Yeah, there was never no one ever asked the question, was it the right thing to do? You know, and I think because that was a really unpalatable thing to ask. And even for me to ask it, I get jip and, and, and grief online asking it and I, I just defend my right to ask it and i i think that I ultimately in the book and as i say i think that you know i, I always quote a man called sydney dows a, a very sort of uh, charming uh raf pilot um who just said i wanted to see a little bit more of the third right before the war was over <laughs> well why not if you're bored and 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 i and i think that you know in terms of assessing you know bushel's motivation whether it was successful you know, did he know that 50 that they were all going to be shot you know, while urinating on the side of the road by Gestapo men, no, we can't possibly say that he knew that. Yeah, yeah. Did he? So you know, so I have to sort of, I have to sort of pull back my my dagger there, Paul. You know, I have to sort mm, of, mm. you know, my Berlin Olympics letter opener. <laughs> there we go. I wrote Wonderful. a book about the Berlin. Every time I every time I write a book, I always buy a little souvenir associated with the book. So there we go. There is my Berlin Olympics, nineteen thirty six. Um, no swastikas on it. And um, but, you know, I pull back the knife from Bushel here and I go, right, you can't possibly have known that. Um, you know, it, 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 it's it's not, you know, it's not fair for me to say, because the worst thing you do as a historian is, you know, put on your hindsight specs and go, yeah, but I, you know, you can't say that. You know, you can't apply what I know to what Bushel would have known. 
So, but did he know it was a far more risky undertaking and pe perhaps more perilous? Yes. yes. Did the P POWs on the escape have to go on the escape? No. Was it voluntary? Yes. You know, so you know, you you didn't you didn't have to go. You may have had a good idea of the risks, and still these guys wanted to do it anyway. You know, so I, I can't judge them for that. I just, but I I wonder whether they really took on board the risks and really really established in the cold light of day whether it was worth it because the escape obviously took a while to plan and to execute in terms of digging tunnels and other tunnels being discovered and so on and so forth you know so if you spent all this time digging this most bloody amazing tunnel you want to use it you know yeah. you don't want to sit yeah. there and go oh well the germans have told us it's getting a bit dangerous you're thinking oh sod it let's just bloody do it i think it does reach a point of critical mass doesn't it there's so much investing in it it's you know, it would it, that yeah. how much the uh, counter argument is how much would that destroy the morale in the camp? Yeah. They decide, no, 100%. we're going to clean it all up now. We're not going to go. You know what? What? What effect would that have had on these people? Would he have come more people going? You know, do lally? I don't know. It's um, and we can. It's it's okay. I think to acknowledge or to 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 in, to consider the viability of the escape and also keep respect for these men for how incredibly brave they were and how it, those you can have both <laughs> those thoughts in your head at the same time that's perfectly okay yeah. as far as i'm concerned i can respect all these men i can respect the family members who 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 looked upon their their loved ones with incredible courage and respect what they did but you can also say in the grand scheme of things was it worthwhile like we can with bomber command we can say yeah. pilots and air crews are great but can we question this the, the, the decision to raid this particular city on this particular case, that occasion that's that it's okay that isn't it but yeah, let's get back to the German response. So it does, you know, that they go really ape shit, and there are some really important people coming in there who, 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 from the Gestapo point of view, who who want to make a point. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share one of the photos you so, show me because I think this is a key figure. I'd like you to talk about this. Yeah, this is a this I'm gonna is say a gentleman there, but I don't want to use that word. Um, yeah, well, he was described actually by the German, his fellow Germans, as a very sort of drawing room style criminal. Uh, he was not clearly, as you can tell, in the SS. He was not in the Gestapo. He was a man called Gunter Absalon. And Absalon, and there he is, obviously, with his child. And he sort of looks as sort of fairly sort of, you know, slightly sort of way-faced sort of, you know, you know, he doesn't look particularly evil. But, you know, he, he's, he, he, went, he went into the camp immediately after the escape to investigate. Now, the investigation wasn't there to look at what the POWs had done. They knew what the POWs had done. They'd dug a great big tunnel in the camp. They'd got some false passes and they'd got a load of uh, fake you know, uniforms and a fake fake kit. Um, and, and the question was not what did they do? The question is how on earth do these POWs get all this stuff? So Gunter Absalon's job was to go and talk to the Germans and, 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 and talk to them without coffee. You know, and, and so he was saying, so it's him, it's the Creepo. They go into the camp and they realize that the escape has taken place with the connivance of, of scores of, of German guards and even some officers, because there's bribery on a huge scale. Mm. Um, and, and one of the and, and the bribery was very much discussed amongst the allies because some allied POWs thought it was very ungentlemanly and, and you shouldn't go around bribing people because it wasn't the kind of correct thing to do and a bit unspiffing. Um, but you know, and so the thing is, I would say, right, Paul. You know, you're a German guard. I'm an ally POW. I've got 10 cigarettes a day. You've got two. OK, so I'm five times richer than you. That means I'm just going to win on the bribe thing here because you're desperate for my fags. So I then say, um, thank you, Welsh 54. I then turn around and say, um, right, here we go, Paul. Do you want to do you want a packet of fags? Um, uh, you know, and maybe, you know, you can you know give me the example of the latest pass. And you go, all right, I'd love a packet of fags because that is 10 days worth of cigarettes for you. That's big numbers. So we then do that little bribe. And then I say, right, Paul, so that bribe, yeah, nice one. I'm going to tell your boss about that, that I bribed you. So I no longer have to bribe you. I don't have to give you your cigarettes. I'm blackmailing you now. Yeah. I'm saying he takes bribes. And that may, might make you have a little one-way ticket to whatever battle's being fought in the snow somewhere further east. So, you know, you're thinking, okay, shit i'm just gonna have to you know do as these guys say and so a lot of the guards were basically completely under the thumb of of, of the of the of the brits uh, and, and to the extent in which you know the the the, the rf formal report into the great escape has said that the, the these aren't my words that the great escape could not have taken place without the assistance 
of the Germans. And that's why I argue in my book that the greatest, the great escape is that it's the finest Anglo-German cooperation since the marriage of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. You know, it could not have taken place. I mean, and, and actually what's just also important to remember, only 50 percent of the great escapers were Brits. I mean, a lot of them were Kiwis, Aussies, South Africans, Poles, Lithuanians, Czechs. You know, Norwegians, Dutch, you name it. You know, it's a pan-European exercise. You know, Ursula von der Leyen would have been proud of the Great Escape. So what's important to remember is the investigations that take place are very much against the Germans, by the Germans, against the Germans. Yeah, prisoners who were caught down the tunnel, yeah, they were given their two weeks in the cooler. Prisoners who were caught on the run and who were caught near the camp by the Luftwaffe were sent back to the camp. Obviously, the big problem is, is what happens to those who end up in the hands of the Kripo because they then get passed over to the Gestapo. And that's what happens to Bushel and his escape partner, escape partner Scheidauer and another 48 prisoners. And those are the ones who are in you know trouble, being being a massive understatement. So it, it's it is a, a, a you know a very difficult situation. Yeah, I mean, and it's thirteen nationalities. I think it was in Escape. If, if yeah, I think okay, well, well, yeah. said. So, so let's let's go. We don't. I don't think we need to dwell too much on the individual stories. Although we'll pick up a couple of them. Yeah, let's do the Bushel story because I think you 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 sent me the the sketch there. And we'll talk about yeah, the, yeah, the Kiel yeah, one, yeah. but um, because once. Once they kind of got their method, it was sort of repeated across. So he's telling yeah. one story, but it definitely wasn't the big one. Big loads of prisoners had a one big truck to one. It was it was small yeah. group, wasn't it? It was, it was, the it was left a big paper trail that we'll talk about a bit later on. It was it wasn't the you know the the big machine gun in the field as in the film. Um, you're quite right, Paul. And I, uh, I mean this this just gives you an example of of how it took place. And just very briefly. Um, uh, uh, Roger Bushell and his escape partner, a free French pilot, a man called Emile Scheidhauer, made their way all the way across almost the Third Reich to Saarbrücken. Um, and they were captured on the train by the amusingly named uh, Fritz Bender, a member of the Kripo. And uh, Fritz Bender had seen that there was an anomaly in their papers. And he said that the anomaly was also come somewhat magnified by the fact that one of them uh, i.e. Scheid, Heron, Bushel, responded to me in English. Now, of course, that's a kind of legendary moment in the movie because it's the Gordon Jackson character yeah. um, uh, who, who who turns around, i.e. Bushel's escape partner, Bartlett, I know, in the movie, uh, who turns around and responds in English to have a good trip, whatever it is, he'd say on the bus. Now, I think it's more likely that the person who responds in English to a question accidentally because he's tired and he's on the run is the Anglophone Roger Bushell rather than the French speaking Emil Scheidhauer? Um, anyway, uh, it, you know, it, it doesn't matter too much, but I think it's important to think that actually, let's not think it's Scheidhauer who gets it wrong. It's probably Bushell, but it's God, it's forgivable after 72 hours of getting across nervously across the Third Reich on the run. Um, they end up in the hands of the Creepo, the criminal police, which is fine. Criminal police, uh, you know, they're just criminal policemen. They are. I'm not saying they're necessarily the nicest guys in the world, but they're not. Very few Creepo people go on trial after the war. They then end up in the middle of the mo one morning in Zarbrücken being transferred to the Gestapo. And they are in the hands of uh, this man called Dr. Leopold Spann, who is on the right of that picture, and a man called, uh, that's, yeah, exactly, and, and a man called Schultz, uh, who I think we got a picture of Schultz there, yeah, yeah on trial after the war. And Schultz was a fairly junior Gestapo man. Span was much more senior. And 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 can we go back to the sketch, Paul? Just uh, talk talk through. Oops. Yeah, nice one. Thank you. And there's a driver called Walter Breithaupt, and uh, they are put in the back of a car, and they are informed that they are going to be driven back to a POW camp. Uh, obviously, that is hundreds of miles away, and uh, because they've gone all the way across Germany, effectively. So obviously Bushel and Scheidhauer suspect they're going to be taken to a, a fairly nearby one, whichever one that is. And after uh, not too long, and Span is saying to Schultz, look, find somewhere to kill them that's not too far away because I don't want to spend too much money on petrol. Um, you know, so this idea that you've got this kind of awful kind of fuel economy to murder axis, this XY ratio is just sick. And mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, they get out of the car. Um, they said we're going to have what the Germans call a pinkelpauser, a P-stop. 
and uh, and uh, they uh, Shidehow and Bush will stand on the side of the road and they're, they're having a pee and, and Schultz and Span come up behind them uh, and, and they shoot them in the back. And uh, Bright Haupt, of course, the man who drew that little sketch after the war, uh, recounts how Span did the job well. Uh, Scheidhau dies immediately, whereas um, actually uh, 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 Schultz does a bad job. And he has to, has to sort of literally get down on the floor and, and sort of lies down and has to put the, the, the revolver or pistol, whatever it is, you know, to Bushel's head and, and finish him off. Um, they then drive away. Um, and uh, David, I'll answer that uh, a little bit later, if that's all right. And um, and, and they, they drive away uh, and, and they say, right, we'll go and get a lorry uh, to, to transport them back to Zarbrook and back to the crematorium. First, we're going to take them to this little mini concentration camp in Zarbrook and where we're going to do all the paperwork, where, they're, uh, where the town doctor is going to come out and formally said they're shot while trying to escape. Town doctor comes out, looks at the bullet wound in the head. He knows what's going on, but he writes down shot while trying to escape. You know, so everything is legalized. And then take it to the crematorium, burnt, put in urns, and then those urns are eventually sent back to, to Stalaglyph 3. And that's how Bushel's life is ended. You know, I mean, for Bushel, his life should have ended, you know, in a blaze of glory and a spitfire. Yeah. You know, that if he if if he you know, if he was going to die during the war, that's probably how he would have wanted to have died. Of course, no one wants to, but that's how he probably would have imagine the true knight of the air an alpha male death not dying while peeing you know convulsing on the floor and being shot badly i mean it's just it's horrible it's horrible it's horrible and it's gruesome uh, and and it, i think it sort of sums up the, the the true repellence of this murder schultz says oh i was ordered to do it by span but you know what those gestapo men didn't have to do it because schimmel was asked after the war, and he was head of the Gestapo in Strasbourg, and uh, he was saying, and he was asked, well, what would you have, and, and he was asked in court, what would you have done if one of your Gestapo underlings had refused to carry out an, an order like that? He said, I would have told them they didn't have to do it, right? That drives mm -hmm. the horses through this whole idea that these guys had to do it. You know, you, there, there's, there is a fantastic academic paper I quote in my book, which looks at the case of 98 SS men who refuse to carry out orders. Not one of them is executed. Not yeah. one of them is sent to the Russian. That, that I think was one of the most um, interesting bits I from your book. There, that again, yeah. it, like the idea that all allies have to be as, uh, to escape. This idea that you can't say no in the SS or it's yeah. either death or off the uh, the Russian front, and you went, well, no, there is, there's, there's no, no evidence of that. It's just, no it's evidence. just, it's hearsay and rumours. Ah, oh, if you do that, yeah, but that's like your parents saying the, the bogeyman will get you if you don't do your homework. There is no actual bogeyman. And some people did say no, and some people said no, and you know, and I was researching the Ardiatine Caves massacre uh, with, and I met a man called Eric Prieper, Priebka, an SS you know, captain who was in the Gestapo in Rome, who carried out the, um, the time case massacre. He drew up the list of the 335 poor people who got murdered in those caves in, in, as a reprisal. And, and, you know, and he, and I remember them reading a report about it and, and, and the, the, the senior Kapler describing how he spoke to one of the young Gestapo officers in a kind of, in a fatherly way to help him shoot people. But, you know, it was clear that some of these young men didn't have to do it. They didn't want to mm. do it. And they were, they did, they weren't ordered to do it. They were talked into doing it so often. It was kind of, you know, do one for the lads and then you've all joined us and it makes them all feel better, you know? So there's a kind of corporate pressure within the Gestapo to do these things, but there's no real mandate in the way that people think there was and in the way that they try to defend themselves, you know, after the war. And also, I think the fact that your book really pointed out the word that comes to my mind is the grubbiness of the murder. It wasn't, it wasn't very well organized. I mean, it was organized in, a, as you said, the, the, the fuel tokers and the petrol and the pistols not working and it going. It was all a bit gr grabby, but yeah, yeah. The I mean, it was who believes it. And also, I, this is the weird thing about maybe it's the British psyche or something is that that we seem to want to have this idea there was a noble end somehow. I was thinking of those murders of the Rimau operation in Singapore when Captain Lyon, the first mission into Singapore, blowing up. The second, they went by kayaks and they were captured by the Japanese. 
and there was this idea that they were they all said goodbye to each other before they were executed and they were put on trial and the Japanese treated it very very nice and in the, the truth turned out is they were just sort of pushed into holes and, and killed hor horribly and why has the movie left us with this idea that they could sort of say that bit where Bartlett Bushnell speaks to Gordon Jackson and says you know it was all worth it and it's kind of the sun's going down there's a sort of almost a, a niceness about it in the movie well, I, I know what you mean I know what you mean and it, I, that's not the right word but a nobility yeah. I think is the word the nobility, I think, is right. I think there is a certain, yeah, there, there's a certain some sense of, you know, it's a sort of the sun goes down, you're with your fellow chaps, and you can reminisce about what at least you had a crack at the crack at the hun type sort of conversation, and and uh, yeah. and there's a sort of beautiful wistfulness of it. The reality is, is that you're dying while holding onto your penis, urinating, being shot. Yeah. Yeah, that I is mean, a grabby end as opposed to the tale of two cities. And, and, and that is sorry if it's a sort of horrible thing to image to put, but that is the truth of it. Um, yeah. And you know, it's 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 horrible, horrible, horrible. Um, can I answer David's question about yeah. whether I? It was again whether I've had sort of any reaction to this sort of myth busting, wasn't it? Yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah, I have. I mean, you know, when yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, you know, I'm I'm not claiming that. Everything I write, David, is set in stone. You know, I'm I'm happy to be told I'm wrong. I'm happy to be proved I'm wrong. Um, frankly, and I I don't, you know, as I say, I don't I don't sort of kind of totally butcher everything and say the whole thing was completely crap. But I I do I do sort of turn around and go, well, there are things that need to be sort of um, you know investigated. I I have had people when the book came out, you know, it was a while ago now, who sort of say. Uh, what does he know? He's talking rubbish. He's talking this. And I go, well, well, fine. But you know, show me what impact The Great Escape had on the German military situation. None. You know, it didn't have any. Um, you know, show me what impact, you know, Bob van der Stock, Jens Müller and Per Bergsland had you know, on the rest of the war, the Allied war effort. None. You know, sh you know it, it's show me the proof that, you know, show me that I show you the proof that the prisoners knew. Yeah. Yeah. Show me, show me to say they're all in blissful ignorance. You know, I, I just don't think that's true. So, you know, show the fact that they were ordered to stop escaping after the Great Escape shows, in an awful, awful, awful way, that the Germans by murdering fifty people stopped it. They went, all right, well, we're going to have no more of that now, and and mm. it worked because then they, they were told. So, I'm not, I'm not defending it as a way of murder, of, of a way of dealing with escaping, which is your. Yeah, you know, you're, 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 but you are mandated in the Geneva Protocols and Geneva Convention. You are allowed to shoot people while trying to escape. You're just not allowed to shoot them on the side of the road while having a pee. Yeah. So you know that you do, you do have a, you know, a, 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 a defense in law to shoot someone running away from you. And tons of prisoners were shot, you know, running away. Um, and tons of prisoners mm -hmm. sort of like people commit death by cop, right? You know, tons of prisoners who went suicidal decided to 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 try and jump over the fence and we see that in the movie that's that's yeah. true you know, yeah. That. yeah yeah so well, I, do, I do get a bit of grief and i'm those who know me um you know know that i'm i'll, I'll, I'll punch back you know I, I i but i like a good scrap and that's fine you know and, well, i mean that's why when i went into this week i thought how is it if I stretch out the great escape to having seven people coming on telling the story in exactly the same way, there's no point doing it. There's there's nah, got to be a, there's got to be to. some kind of point to the whole week so that people can look at the shows and they'll have they'll have their favourites and the ones they were. Well, I didn't quite like that one because he kind of spoiled my misery. Well, that one <laughs> they reinforced. But <laughs> let, we want to touch before we end on the on the investigation because yes, yes, what, gosh, what, yes, yeah, it, it was they. The RAF and the British put a lot of effort into this. So, what what yeah. was the thing that made this? That was it simply the number of yeah. people. It was, it was a big. It was it was it wasn't the biggest massacre of Allied troops or servicemen. I mean, there were things like Malmedy and, and Vermouth yeah. and things like that. And it was by far not the the, the numerically the biggest crimes the Nazis committed. I I, I can think of those that run into the million. Um, but it did shock. Britain at the time, there, there. It, when when it, the news of it came back to Britain, you know, during the war. Well, there you go. And um, you know, there was a service of remembrance during the war at St Martin the Fields in Trafalgar Square. You know, this was a big, big, big deal, and it made you know the prisoners. You know, it, it made there be a worry that maybe there were going to be massacres. You know, towards the end of the war of POWs. So there, there was a, a it was a big deal. This. And the reason why we know about The Great Escape is largely because of what you're showing. It's because it's a murder story as much as an escape story. Um, and there is a good book specifically about 
the uh, uh, about the investigation, and it's called Ah. Why have I forgotten it? Um, Someone will know. Who's it by? Anyway, it's a good book. I've got it. It's in my bibliography. And um, I've, I've seen you a moment. Anyway, I um, the investigation carried out by the RAS Special Investigation Branch, the SIB, and we've got some pictures of the reconstructions, haven't we? I, I think I've sent yeah. you. So um, of the of the that is the reconstructions of the four chaps who were killed outside Kiel. Um, and now you can see there they're wearing RAF uniforms. I think pretty short. Some yeah. of you chaps will know your uniforms better, but they look like RF uniforms to me. And the, they are that shows you how the, the four men were shot, clearly not shot while trying to escape, shot by a, a man who was desperate to get to the theatre on time. So he decided to do it as quickly as he could. Um, and uh, so there was, and then we've also got pictures of the murders uh, by Ernst. Uh, That's the guy who ordered the murders outside Kiel. But we've also got the murders in the snow as well, haven't we, by the car of Zacharias. Uh, I don't think you sent me those ones. Did I not? There's one by a car. Um, but oh, well, don't worry. I, I'm always, I can always tweet it if people go to that guy, Walters. Maybe I didn't get it. I don't know. No, don't worry. Or, or maybe it was a corrupt file. Anyway, they also, so they carried out a full investigation and it, and it was given a big deal. And I've written a book called Hunting Evil, another, another quid someone can spend. And, and, and I read, in which I look at all the war crimes, um, uh, hunt for Nazi war criminals. And, you know, obviously that goes to Brazil and Argentina and places. The amount of resources put on the Great Escape murders by the RAF Special Investigation Branch were almost equal to the amount that the British Army put in their war crimes investigation. To that found it. <laughs> well found. And uh, so we can see, you know, that, again, really sums up how horrible it would have been. Um, and probably very similar weather, you know, so that would have been in 1946, mm. of course, after the war, um, uh, but, you know, re recreating something that took place during it. And um, so, you know, the amount of resources that the RAF were given in order to, that's it, Leslie, thank you very much, my fellow runner. And um, and anyway, so, yeah, the amount of resources were huge and you actually have proper proper uh, detectives on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the task looking for the guys who, who carried it out. And, you know, in the appendix of my book, you know, the amount of people from Hitler all the way down to an accessory to murder like Walter Breithaupt, you know, you got about 200 people ultimately, who are corporately responsible for the Great Escape murders. What proportion of those men are brought to justice? 15, 20 percent? You know, Adolf Hitler isn't. We know that. Um, yeah. You know, you, you've got a lot of these Gestapo guys who uh, end up being killed in fighting. They either commit suicide. Uh, they are never seen again. Um, some of them are captured. They are brought to various trials that take place in Hamburg, especially, and they are hanged. Uh, Schultz is hanged, and we've got a picture of him in the dock. We showed him earlier, looking a little bit sheepish. Uh, that which one is that? That is uh, anyway. But we've also that's a great picture. I've sort of got who it is, but we got Schultz looking very sheepish in the dock as well. And um, yeah, there we go. That's one of the great escape trials. And and you know, the, you know, you can see his picture there, looking kind of you know, he looks a bit a bit sheepish. But yeah, you know, he he just said he was following orders. But you know, too bad, mate. You know, that's not a defence. Uh, good question, David. I, I don't think they did, to be honest. I really don't think they did. Um, I mean, I think they may have had evidence of other things, but I, I'm really not sure that that would carry that would require a big fishing expedition of all the files, which you so, know anyone doesn't always have time to do. So what happens is a lot of the guys who are captured they do get hanged, but if they're captured in kind of 47, 48, there is less likelihood, and this is true of other war criminals that they're going to be hanged. They're going to get long prison sentences and often they're then commuted down to shorter ones because there was started to be a public mood, somewhat erroneously in my book, that actually these guys didn't have much of a choice, poor chaps following orders, you know, they're but the grace of God. You know, if we had lost the war, what war crimes did we commit, you know, which we're never going to know about because we won? Is this victor's justice? And so it's, it's you know, if you were caught <clears throat> like Emil Schultz quite soon, then you're probably a bit screwed. Indeed, yeah. he, was. he was hanged. But if you were caught like two, three years later and tried, tried and convicted by the Western powers, you were likely not to hang. I mean, Tim, Tim Cook goes through this superbly in his book, Fighting for History, about the Canadian 
um, understand their own history with the examination of the Kurt Meyer story and shows oh, yeah, how yeah, yeah. very quickly it goes from kill them all, kill some yes. of them, lock them up, lock them up for a short time, let them let them go. Really, you know, two yeah, or three years, yeah. the public opinion just changes, and he, he charts this course of, of, I, of how I, end up Kurt Meyer ended up serving seven I, years or something. You know, I know that's I a think separate that's absolutely story. right, and that nail, but that nails that progression in terms of public opinion and mood. Look, by forty-five. And I know air war end doesn't end in the Far East till a few months later. Uh, the great escapers, none, none of them are on the route lines to go to South America. None of them. I can tell you that confidently. And uh, I, there, there is no public mood for spending years and years and years doing manhunts for these people. You know, the, the, the war crimes investigation teams are wrapped up in 48, 49. Yeah. Um, and many of the war crimes investigation teams are... Um, you know, are are staffed by people who didn't fight in the war, either because they were a bit rubbish or or they were just a bit young, so they didn't have the chance of serving, you know, in combat or in a minute more a more more sort of active capacity. And and they didn't attract necessarily the brightest of the bunch. And and you know, they, they were wound down because you know the, the list of war criminals, I've I don't have my book to hand, it's huge. It, it, it's a centuries-long job trying to find these people. Yeah. And you've got more important jobs. Everyone wants to go back home. Everyone wants to rebuild Europe. Everyone wants to rebuild their lives. You've had a, a, a the most destructive war on the bloody planet. And what do you want to do? You're going to spend 30 years doing manhunts around Germany? Or are you just going to go, you know what? Let's put a few to justice. Let's hang a few. Let's not hang a few. Yeah. Get on our bloody lives, you know. We're in the middle of we're, we're real rebuilding. We're established a, na a national health service. We've got the Labour Party in the government. There's a new era. It's put the but it's it's a different time. It's it's yeah. time to time to move on. But I'm gonna have one last question for you, and it's maybe not an easy uh -huh. one to ask, but it's kind of I'm being devil's advocate again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. The, good. the way that that headline was that the, the emphasizing the murders might some of that have been to take attention away from the folly of the escape in the first place. In the, if you just say, forget, look, forget about what Bushnell did, look, about, look at the response. Um, because if there hadn't been an investigation, would people have maybe started to look at it early and say, what, so what was the point of that again? How did that happen? Because obviously we weren't oh, reporting the fact that 8,000 members of the uh, other escaping people were rounded yeah, yeah, up. Yeah. We weren't, we, that wasn't reported. Yes, um, and, I, and, and that's, that's what my book tries to be a corrective of. I think that's a good question. Do I know the answer? Maybe. It were, was the actual act of murder, in the sense, a distraction from the folly of the escape? Yeah, that's, question, that's what I'm it? saying. I mean, that's, I, I don't necessarily say that I agree with that. I'm just, while I've got you, we're in this conversation. <laughs> yeah, I'm, no, play, uh, I'm playing that ace. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, now you got me. Shit. I, I, I think, yeah, I think it is. I think you're right. I think, I think, I think, I think it is a distraction from it. I think that clearly it stops people asking the big questions of why did it happen because it feels disrespectful to those who died saying that your lives were wasted and we we see now you know when we're asking questions about afghanistan and our role there i'm not going to get into it but if mm. i lost a son in afghanistan and i read a report in the newspaper saying that our presence in afghanistan has made no difference and the taliban is still there and blah 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 i'm going to ask why did my son die yeah. And, you know, and you might well ask, why did my son die, Roger <laughs> Bushel? But you can't ask Roger Bushel because he's been yeah. shot. So in well, the end, I guess it's maybe the death of Bushel that may stop those big, hard questions yeah. about why. I mean, this it came up on the show with the family members is that you get this sense that because 50 men were murdered, it's very difficult to criticize any of those men and uh, because they've been put on a kind of some kind of pedestal now because they've been immortalized as having been killed horribly in the, in the yeah. war. So therefore say, well, perhaps you should have done that. Perhaps they should, perhaps they shouldn't have gone out with cost uh, disguises that weren't complete. Perhaps they shouldn't have spelt things wrong on the, on the passes, but to, to end the things off guy, you know, I've asked everybody else this week, 77 years on, what is the legacy of the great escape to you personally? What there, there are some positives of teamwork and resourcefulness yeah. and, and what me, the human beings can do under duress. So, so, so it, you know, with, despite all your, um, <laughs> in, your, yeah. your negativity for want of a better word yeah, no, it is negativity yeah it there is. is a legacy of 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 respect for what people can do i I, I i i think that it my fundamental feeling about the greatest gate is that it, it, it it's a lesson in that we must be careful not to 
mythologize and and overly celebrate you know wartime events because you know mo you know I, I i start getting uncomfortable when people are just a bit too much into tanks they're designed to kill people in the most horrible way possible and if you die in a tank it's the most horrible thing possible i i i, I don't know I, I start i start getting problems. so my 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 thing is it's i um uh, yeah. Tim, he was referring to laughing at Schultz earlier, and he was just oh, right. okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. I got Tim, it. Tim's a good fan of the show. Yeah, uh, no, I, I, and I, I, so I do think that my the, the lesson for me is, you know, the, the whole purpose of the book, the whole purpose of my thesis is, you know, I think these stories are stronger and better when you look at them in the round, and yeah. when you don't just say it's all chaps doing great things and Yahoo, blah blah blah. What, what great, you know, you know, tally ho, chaps and brilliant, aren't, aren't they great? You know. Actually, no. It's a compl war is complicated. It, 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 it's about the grey areas, yeah. and and I and I really think that you know it, it's it's that's what it teaches me. And it, you know, go easy on 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 going too 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 big and too hard on these things. You know, I mean, don't, don't I, a, of, a few shows recently, I'm going to uh, in, introduce a line of merchandise with nuance is the new sexy because that's the. <laughs> The truth is always in the nuance, isn't it? The great yeah. escape is neither. It's it's it's, the, the, it's finding that balance between understanding how you're managing men in a camp. They're interred. There's lots of people there. Massey and Bushel are all doing that thing. And then there's looking at the murders and the horrible reprisals and all that. And looking at it, looking at it, the whole thing with nuance. And he, yeah. he don't, one of us have to make some sound bite. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say the great escape was a waste of time. I would never no. say that. Yeah. It's finding that it's finding that balance and being able to look at it objectively 77 years on and say there's lessons we can learn from it about historiography, about how history has been reported. To me, that's where the great escape will sit now is how differently this story has been told through books, movies. Yeah. And maybe in 20 years' time, and we're in our uh, pensioners' homes, there'll be some new movie or there'll be some yeah. new look at it that will, that will take all the previous ideas and balance it all out and say, now now, now we can accept here's where it sits in history at this yeah, level. No, well, my, my, my book has been optioned by a by, by you know TV company in L.A. So we're hopefully, sure. there'll be a, hopefully there'll be a series about it. So fingers crossed. Then, you know. Well, I, I, excellent. I, 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 you know, it's it, you're right, and I, I do think the nuance is important, and and I, you know, br bring it on, you know, and I, I'm not saying, but the, the just to finish off, I don't want to say just cause, just because I don't think X to be true, only Y can be true. Instead, there are elements of X that are still absolutely fine, and 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 there are, and but but I'm saying is let's think a bit about Y as well, and let's blend it all together, and let's have an X Y package rather than just one or the other. Absolutely. I think thank that's, you, that's it in a nutshell. So, well, thank you very much, Mr. Walters, for joining us. That was that was a really good one. Wow. Captain, hey, Captain, I've Captain. got my Woody Memorial sort of like. We, we look like we're we're, we're um, auditioning for a kind of a low budget remake of Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking. Yeah, the kind of the yeah, yeah, uh, it's the late a, night yesterday channel kind of version. A slightly, <laughs> a slightly rubbish Peaky Blinders, but uh, <laughs> God bless you. Anyway, I thought I'd wear well, that in your honor, Paul, to say no, thank thanks, you. Guy. Thank I mean, you. We'll, we'll, so for those watching, I'll say goodbye to Guy in a minute. Don't forget, join us in another two, uh, two hours. We'll discuss the film. Robbie Maguire and Matthew Moss from Fighting on Film and Marion Walters will join us. We'll just, just talk about the film and how it sits in the pop culture and how, as an Englishman of our age or British, all you have to do is make that good luck that voice to someone. Everyone knows what you're talking about. You can waggle your trousers in a certain way and everyone knows you're talking about penguins and Great Escape and we can talk about that. So it remains me to say thanks, Guy, for joining us. Um, we'll have you on again to do something about hunting Nazis. And for everybody else, I will see you all again on World War II TV later on with our movie show. So it's been enjoyable, this. We've tackled some nice subjects and I've... I respect Guy's knowledge and his honesty in looking at it from a different point of view. So thanks, Guy. That was great. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. I'll see you all later on. Bye.